What's up guys, so uh, before we jump into this video, I kind of wanted to talk about a few things. Uh, I really recommend you guys to watch this whole video because the process of making industry on products is actually really interesting and I don't think I had any idea how cool it was. Um, and number two, um, this is actually a very special video because there's not a lot of people out there who get to tour Industry 9 and there's even fewer people who get to tour Industry 9 with the uh, founder and owner, uh, Clint Spiegel. Um, so you're going to meet Clint Spiegel in today's video and you're, you're also going to meet uh, David Thomas who is the sales and marketing director of Industry 9. Uh, you know, when you put on a lot of bike parts on your bike, there's a lot of bike parts out there where when you put them on, you know, your bike doesn't really ride a whole lot different. Uh, for the most part, it feels generally the same. Um, but as, some, as a lot of you guys know, when you put Industry 9 parts on your bike, there's a night and day difference um, from when you put it on. Uh, from the engagement on the hubs, to the stiffness in the wheels, to the overall quality of the whole build in general. Um, and so I really recommend you guys to watch this whole video to you know see how this process is done. Um, so without further ado, let's get into the video. So, like what, if you were to say, you know, like what is Industry 9 all about? What would you, what would you like to tell them about? You know, Industry 9 as a brand as a whole. You know, we just try to make and design the best stuff. You know, a little background of it. This building we're about to walk in was actually um, my father started this basically the same year I was born. I've actually worked there all my life. So we started as a contract manufacturer and so we really know how to machine metal. And um, so when I started getting, you know, really uh, passionate about riding, it was easy to design stuff that, you know, made our riding better. And then having a machine shop, we're able to just constantly prototype and constantly make better stuff. So at any rate, those bars will be plugged into links like this, and I'll show you the machine that does that. And then on this machine, the internals will be machined, and that's you know basically the bearing bores and the drive ring. Contour the outside, maybe drill some of the holes that are going into it. Any given part we make may have five or six machines or more running it. For here, we take this pre-drilled tube, and then that will become the axle. So I like to give people an example of the tolerance. So you see the width of that piece of paper? If you divided that into 20 equal segments, one of those segments is essentially how accurate the bearing, the bearing spacing on this axle. You've got, uh, there's cassette body, so again, it'll start out as a slug of material, and then it'll machine the various bores and threads on it. The next operation will mill the paw pockets and the spline, and I'll show you that next. So we started out as a contract manufacturer. Um, right now, 75% of this building makes Industry 9 parts, but the other 25%, we still do contract work. And so these are actually giant connectors for fiber optic cables that go under the ocean connecting the continents. So these big ships will just have cable potted in it and they'll screw them together, drop them to the bottom of the ocean. Guys, this is so cool. There's so much cool stuff here. Top pockets and the splines on the all these, you look right in here, all these machines have this, this water-soluble coolant that keeps them lubricated and cooled down. But I can let it run a little bit without it on there, but if you look in there in the tool, you can see the tool moving around. And this is making the hall pocket. Uh, now, I'll have to stop it there and put the coolant back on. But you see that coolant spray? Yeah. There you go, right. So that's what it has to run on it for it to not break the tool. See how it's changing the tool there? Yeah. That's doing the drilling operation for the uh, stem bolts. But after that's done, and you can watch it here in just a second to see if we can keep from getting wet. But see, it'll finish up drilling the hole, then it'll take another tool that will do another aspect. So that is tapping the hole. So you see how the thread screws in, it's a tap screws in, and then it reverses and screws out. So what basically happens is that part will look like that, and then it'll be loaded in this machine, and then the final operation will be done. Yeah, the best stem out there. Yeah, <laughs> heck yeah. So you see how it's turned at an angle right there? That's the great thing about these five axis machines is they'll just turn at different angles to get what you need done, done. So right here, you see it? Right there, it just turned again. At a different angle. It makes filming difficult to get on your camera. <laughs> Sorry about that. Over here is where we do a lot of 
the uh, so-called drilling for the hub and the hammer, just depending on whatever the hub. So you can see right there, you got a five-axis machine that was just drilling it and see how it tilted down like that. And you can look on the back side and see what it's doing. It's putting the chamfers on the back side of the so-called right there. And this is our um, quality control department. So basically, you can use this joystick to jog this probe around and then it'll just probe the, um, the internals of a, of a shell. So like if you had something like this, you can move in there and use this probe to make hundreds of probe points on a cylinder. And basically what that does is it just makes sure that your cylinder bore, that your bearings are pressed in are really, really accurate. So no bore, no cylinder is perfect. So what this thing will do is probe all around it. The computer will calculate the best fit, theoretically perfect cylinder that fits in all those points. And then it'll look at every single point that is outside of that perfect cylinder. And that's how you determine by how much, how much it's out of that perfect cylinder, how good your pores are. You know, that, that sheet of paper example I used, it's measuring discrepancies in the cylinder that may be, you know, a 20th of that sheet of paper. I'm like in heaven right now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get a lot of opportunity to actually see how stuff is made. Right. This machine is cutting our drive rings, the teeth on the drive ring. So what's going on right now is this machine is using electricity that will arc over onto the steel and cut the teeth in the ring. So at any rate, a ring will start out looking like this. And then this machine is gonna push, cut the teeth in it. So you can see the teeth on this screen. So see this, see this little dot right there? Yeah. That's how fast it's moving. Let's see, we can actually expand it here a little bit, I believe. So see how, how that's moving? That is one of the teeth and that it has. Our rings have 115 of those teeth. So let's just watch this real quick. So 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4, Probably double that, 26 seconds to do one team. And there's there's 115 on the ring. So basically to finish a, a ring, it takes us about 45 minutes, which is a really special process that allows the teeth to be as strong as they possibly can and as accurate as they possibly can. And that's what allows us to get that really, really fast drive mechanism. So basically here in another about 30 minutes, we'll see that one finished and um and we'll take it out of the machine hey, you see that little spark you see that little blue spark going on in there yeah yeah so that's what's basically doing the cutting and that's what's happening you can see right here a finished spring and get a better sense of what's going on so it's, it starts out with this solid ring like this and then you can see the little wire path and then it moves around, dances around, and then when it's done, this will be taken out and thrown away, and then you have a ring with teeth in it. But this is, you can see the spoke coming out of the machine here, but basically what's happening is all the machining is going on right there. And, and these spokes, they start out as a 12-foot bar of aluminum, and then it goes to this machine, and it machines, machines that this machine is a special machine called a sliding headstock machine, and it's designed to make parts that are really long and skinny. But what's really special about how we make these spokes is um, on our system wheels, um, we use this as the spoke and it's a machined one piece. It doesn't have a nipple, so the nipple is part of the spoke and it just drops through the rim and screws directly in the hub shell. But one of the things that um, makes re this better than regular wire spokes is you see our thread is oversized. So if you looked at a wire spoke, that thread would be way smaller. So the thread is the smallest diameter on the spoke thus the most likely to break. So we made the spoke a lot stronger by making this, this thread oversized. And then we also, by integrating the, the nipple, you'd lose that connection point, which makes it a lot stronger. All right guys, so right now we're gonna move on to the uh, anodized stuff. Um, and so I'm actually really, I'm really excited to see this because you know, the anodized colors just makes all the parts pop. Anodized is one of the coolest things we do. Uh, we actually, we started anodizing ourselves when we first started Industry 9. We outsourced our anodizing to some other, you know, top anodizers around the country, but they couldn't, the country, but they couldn't match the colors. And I'll explain to you why the colors are so hard to match. 
But basically, anodizing is an electrochemical process that converts the top layer of aluminum to aluminum oxide. Now, that does two things. It makes the surface scratch resistant, so, um, you know, hits, sand, rocks, whatever, won't damage it. But it also makes the surface of the aluminum slightly porous so it can absorb dye. So anodizing isn't a painting process, it's a dyeing process. It's, cut, it's closer to dyeing Easter eggs. So these are the dye tanks. If you were to take an Easter egg and stick it in here, it would actually come up to the color. Ooh, wow. But if you took a slug of aluminum and dipped it in here, the dye would just wash off. So what we're doing here is, is creating a microscopic pore structure that allows the dye to be absorbed. So at any rate, so to do this, you have to rack your parts on these racks that conduct electricity. You also have to polish. To get the best surface finish, you have to make sure, or to get the best look, you have to polish the surface of the material. And those machines over there are what, what are doing the polishing, and I'll show you those in a minute. But you rack them on these racks, and it has to conduct electricity through the entire rack and through the part. So what you do is you move over here, is you, you hang them on these racks, and you have this power supply that meters a, a very specific current through the bar, through the racks, through the solution, and then, and then to the cathode that completes the circuit. So these two tanks are the same, but you notice how this one's white yeah. and this one's more of a gray, green, gray. What, what's happening is this is basically a diluted sulfuric acid, but this, the chemical reaction is happening. And so these little, the, what makes it white are hydrogen atoms being released. After it's been in here about an hour, it will create the surface that then you can dip into the tank and then the longer you leave them in there, the more the color comes up until you get the right color. But here's the deal. You have to have everything incredibly process controlled to make sure that your colors come out right. So every one of these tanks have to be exact right temperature, the right chemical composition, the right pH, the right time that goes into it. But the most sensitive element is what's going on in these tanks. So when it's, when it's doing that chemical conversion, you are creating heat. And so the, um, you have these heat exchangers and a computer controller that are turning on and off the valve to keep these tanks at exactly 70 degrees. If it goes even a half a degree warmer, 70 and a half degree, the pore structure, this is microscopic, but still microscopically, the pore will become wider and shallower. But if it goes even a half a degree colder, the pore will become smaller diameter and deeper. And what that means is it changes how the dye is absorbed. So the worst dye is the green dye, and it's got, it's a two-part dye, and it's got a yellow molecule and a blue molecule. Yellow and blue make green. But unfortunately, the yellow molecule is a little bit bigger than the blue molecule. So if you have that wide pore, more of the yellow will absorb less of the blue, and you'll get a yellowish green. Or if it's too small and tight, you'll get a bluish green. But over here is where we do a really high production. Up. So our OEM customers are pretty much always buying black. So this is going to be just for black anodizing. And you can see black stem, black caps, cassette bodies are all black. And we built this all of our, all ourselves. You know, we have highly capable people that are able to do all kinds of machines and system building. One that's wrong. Okay, cool. So that's what a stem faceplate looks like when it comes first off the machine. So it's a nice finish and it looks good, but you can see a couple little surface imperfections, maybe a little bit of a burr on there. And so then you tumble it. And in these, these machines, are, they spin the parts really fast and they're an individual container so they don't beat against each other. And it, it takes off just a little bit of the metal and rounds the corners and stuff like that. And then when that is done, it goes into this other machine. Do you have a finished one anywhere? Do you have a polished one? Uh, oh, she does. Yeah. So then it'll go into this machine and it'll come up to this mirror polish. And that's all happening by spinning it in this medium. So this media is basically a walnut shell with a little polishing compound oh, really? impregnated into it. Yeah. Oh wow. So it just spins it really high, high RPMs until it gets that surface. All right guys, so we're gonna head over to the uh, other building now and uh, Dave's gonna show us around over there, right? Indeed, yeah, we're gonna Ooh. show you how, the, how all of this turns into wheels and hubs. Yeah, so let's head over there. All right, so we're heading to the uh, 
next facility right now, the uh, the other, I guess is there, this is where they ship stuff out from, this is where a lot of the final product is, Order the assembly. At um, West so, we're, we're meeting Dave there right now, and I think Clint is coming uh, shortly. Uh, so we'll see him there. So what, explain to us where we are right now. All right, so right now we are at our 150 location, uh, just a couple minutes down the road uh, from our 21 machine shop where we were just uh, at. This is where we're gonna do all of our wheel and hub assembly. Uh, 21 and 25, the buildings that we were just in, kind of do all of our uh, raw material processing. So that's where our machine shop is, that's where our anno lab is, that's where all of our uh, polishing and cosmetic stuff happens. Over here at 150, this is where we're actually gonna do all of the uh, wheel hub assembly. We're gonna take the anodized parts and uh, turn them into stuff for your bike. The wheel assembly is here, service department is here, shipping is here, our sales and marketing office is here, uh, and our engineering uh, offices are here as well. The shipping area where we have uh, boxes of wheels getting loaded up. Here. So I think a good place to start is kind of where we left off at 21. So at 21, uh, one of the last things we saw was our anodization process. So here we have a anodized stem. Uh, we just got finished with the laser etch process on these. And uh, let's go on the other side here. We have another laser etcher on uh, the other side and I hear it operating. So let's see what's going on over there. Sam has a bunch of mountain bike hub shells there that don't have any branding on them. They just came from 21, all black there. So we got to let the world know who they are. So uh, these are clocked. We want the, the logos to be on a certain place. Three, two, one. What? That's crazy. <laughs> Go. Every free hub body and every stem body and every stem face plate is gonna pass through one of our three laser etching machines. Then we kind of bring it over here to this uh, inventory area. Oh wow. So this is where we're gonna keep uh, pretty much all of our ready to assemble inventory. So all of our colored hub shells, all of our spokes, uh, axles, those, those aren't in, uh, Anodized, this is where we keep some of this inventory. End caps over here. We have our BOMs generated. And that's a bill of material, which is pretty much calls for everything that the uh, wheel is going to use. So we have spokes, rims, hub shells, uh, bearings on there, free hub body parts, the um, both the hubs for our standalone hub product and our system wheels are all gonna start out of this area here. So free hub body assembly uh, on the closest bench here and then hub assembly as we go down the line. So hubs, uh, after they come through here, we do a QC check to make sure that the bearings are spinning freely, the uh, mechanism is working correctly. So what are what are your fav personal favorite hubs to ride or right at? now? Yeah, what, what do oh, you? Um, Hydra. Hydra. All the way. Hydra, right? All the way. Can't go wrong with Hydra. Yep. Everybody knows you guys. I know you guys all love Hydra. You just can't go wrong with a Hydra. You know, they're just that that engagement is just something you can just you can't live without. <laughs> can't live without it. Once you once you once you try it, you never go back. Hell yeah. But even even the one one hubs are good. I uh, I was actually riding a set of the one one hubs for a long time prior to our launch during our development process. But the one one hubs are just still awesome. There, it was a good ride last night. Amazing ride. We had a good ride. For all you guys that don't know, he was on the ride. I'm yeah, pretty sure you do know because we were talking for a good bit. Yeah, we climbs. talked for a while. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah, we got to ride again soon. That's right. Just like that. That's yeah. so cool. So, if you guys don't know, I have the uh, Hydra S um, on my, the Trail S on my portal, and then I have the um, Enduro 3, 315s on my Hardline. Um, so I ride both of those. So that kind of gives you an idea of what I ride in case you guys didn't know. Yeah, so you can see that someone ordered um, with an alternating blue and purple spoke. 
So like I mentioned, when we were reviewing the BOMs, we're able to type in our production order and actually match the, uh, the lacing pattern that the rider wants to the finished product here. Because these are trail 270 and then these are the, the 305. 305. Yeah. So it'll be a little different. Yeah, so these are all laced up. Now they're just going to get in the queue to go into the Holland machine. I'm going to tape them up here and then all of the wheels will go on that empty rack right there. We boxed up uh, the wheels, but these are all going to make their way eventually over to that rack for packaging and boxing. Well, ready to go of, and yeah we're pretty we're pretty well positioned for future growth because this is our whole building but on the other side of the wall oh wow plenty of room to expand oh wow <laughs> what's pretty up cool. how are you dude i'm doing good what are you working on some hubs dude some, some fronts oh yeah yeah oh. some 15 millimeter fronts yeah 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 cool man stuff. getting some good putting some bearings in yeah dude how's your tour going it's going good it's going good yeah yeah how's your day at work going great dude yeah yeah nothing's better man sweet <laughs> all right i'll see you. cheers <laughs> christian here is working on stems right now so yeah all of our stems fresh off the laser here getting ready to go into inventory look at all these colors guys this is heaven right here i'm actually if you guys are following my instagram uh, you'll know that I'll be giving away an Industry 9 stem. All you guys got to do is find me, uh, and maybe maybe I'll give it to you. Who knows, right? So uh, make sure you guys are following me on Instagram. What's up, guys? How are you? Good. Good. Hey, man. So you got Willie, Dave, Ricky. These are service dudes, and I think uh, Chad might have helped you with your wheel, but like I mentioned, he's over running prototyping stuff at 21 right now. But yeah. yeah, when we get uh, when we get service needs or real rebu wheel rebuilds or any kind of troubleshooting questions, uh, this is the guys that you talk to. So. All right, guys. So that was the tour of Industry Nine of both of their uh, both of their buildings, Clint and Dave. They both, you know, showed showed us around. And so, thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank uh, you, you guys. guys. Are the best. Thanks a lot. <laughs> pop the at Industry Nine tags up right there. You guys want to follow Industry Nine for sure? Because I mean, look at these hubs. You know, you guys know these are your favorite colors right here. And you guys just, you know, found out how they're made and and uh, how they get sent to your door. So, yeah, cool stuff. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. All right. I'll see you guys later. All right.